Well, good morning, and thank you. Thank you. Big thanks to Joe Rayo. To everyone, big thanks. I want to thank you all for being here at the NEEF 2019. I also want to thank you for bringing the great weather. The last couple of years, you know, we've been lucky, but today looks like an absolutely fabulous day. It looks like we're having a great weekend set up for you. We have an ex extraordinary se series of speakers set up for you, and it's my pleasure to bring out the first speaker from Kennedy Space Center. She and her colleagues were technicians that performed extremely important functions in both the space shuttle and the design of the recovery system for the Orion craft. Her techniques and her, her uh, the diligence ensured safety in the, in the shuttle program. She's a wonderful speaker. She's an educator. She's important for all of us because of what she brings to the table. Please give a warm welcome to NEEF 2019, Jean Wright. Thank good you. you. Okay. Oh wow. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Good morning. Thank you guys for taking the time to come here today. Um, I think uh, my name is Jean Wright, and they've already said that. I wanted to thank all the team of NEEF. They've made me feel very, very welcome, and I wanted to thank the Rockland um, Astronomy Club because without them, I would not be here. Um, I think it's an important story that I have to say today because I'm no slight against my honorary so sisters as I call my ladies at ILC Dover and Bill's one of our speakers today. He also has a team of ladies that work for the spacesuits and I have to admit that's a little disappointing for me because when I tell people that I sewed for NASA, the first thing everybody says is, oh, you must have done the spacesuits and I go, no. We have our own special team. Believe it or not, and this is really blows everyone's mind, we actually flew, um, excuse me, sewn flight hardware. We did a lot of things besides flight hardware, like the slide wire baskets if the astronauts had to do an emergency escape down the, down the wires, we did the baskets for that. We had to go on the pad because we have special gox hoses on the pad that at the very top of the beanie cap, that, that occasionally because they're exposed to the elements, we have to hand sew patches up at 410 feet up in the air. And for a woman who's petrified of heights and you have to go up there and work, you just say a few prayers before you step off that big old elevator and look through the graded floor and realize, oh my, I can't believe I'm up here. So it's exciting to be up there anyway. So I will start. Um, here we go. There we go. So here I am. I, right now, I'm currently a docent, which means I volunteer at the visitor complex at Kennedy Space Center. And that beautiful lady that's behind me, that's the space shuttle Atlantis. Here we go. See, that's why I own this place pose, because I do. I love, I love her. I love her. Oops, sorry. Excuse me. There we go. There. So what we have right here is Oh, it just jumped again. I'm so sorry. There we go. This is our, our shuttles right here. And she's heading over to the vehicle assembly building, which is this building right here. Um, and there's just a side view of her. It's exciting because we call it the flow period. And what was supposed to be launching a shuttle once a week, which of course did not turn out to be that way, on average our flow period, which means the time we get the shuttle ready, I mean she lands until the time we get her ready to go again, it averaged between six to nine months uh, be between flights, except for one time when we had the shuttle Atlantis who had just got done in California being a mod and getting everything all spiffed up. That was the shortest turnaround for us for a shuttle it was just an unheard of two months. The only thing we had to do was to waterproof the blankets and tile and she was ready to go again. So I, I start off with, because my last name happens to be right, no relation, but I bring this up is because I've had a lot of experiences with Wright Brother history. I've uh, been to Kitty Hawk. I was honored enough when they found out that I was a seamstress on the space shuttle. They actually let me go into the room and uh, you can see in the bottom right hand corner right here, that's one of the Wright Brothers sewing machines. They found when they went to Kitty Hawk, 
that the wings were way too long for the plane that they built in Ohio. So we had our very first postmistress, Addie Tate, and the Wright brothers stayed with her for, stayed with her for two weeks and they realized they needed to shorten the rings by at least two feet. So Addie bought her sewing machine for only three dollars and it's an 1899 Singer. Um, and, and actually it was Wilbur who um, did most of the sewing, if not mo all the sewing. Anyway, that's her sewing machine. They actually let me put white gloves on and pretend I was sewing. For anybody who sews or loves history, just the fact that I was able to touch the sewing machine brought tears to my eyes. So there I am right there touching it with my little white gloves. <laughs> so the woman that I have up in the upper left-hand corner, her name is Ida Holgrieve. And that's who we ladies who sewed on the shuttle look at us as a, as a heroine to us. Because for the longest time, that photograph was in a lot of historical books, but nobody had any clue who she was. So when we had the 100th anniversary of the Wright brothers' flight, the uh, Wright State University teamed with uh, the National Avionics uh, Historical Group to just put a call out to see if they could find somebody who might have worked at, with the Wright brothers. It just so happens there's a man named John Taylor who, when they had this picture in the newspaper, took the paperwork to Wright State to Don Dewey, who's the curator there, and that's how we were able to find out her name for the very first time. Applause to her because we, I always tell everybody, if it wasn't for the Wright brothers, we wouldn't have the shuttle. And eventually, she, um, we worked, she worked on World War I planes, and I find it kind of ironic that one of the first ladies that sewed on airplanes, she uh, took her first flight at the age of 88. Um, and, and she, when a reporter asked her afterward how she felt about flying for the first time, she said she was amazed, but that the clouds looked like balls of wool to her. Now again, I'm showing just, just the tedious process. This is when they were re restoring the 1911 Wright Flyer, and, I, and it shows all the handwork, and there we go. Now I have our Project Apollo, like I said, Bill speaking this afternoon, um, and I, I, always, I always talk about this, uh, the <laughs> Apollo sewing, because everybody thinks that we did it too, but we didn't, um, and you can see all the ladies hard at work. Uh, I find it ironic, a lot of people don't know that ILC stands for International Latex Corporation. Before they started working on Apollo suits, the company wasn't doing too well. They were making bras and panties and girdles and baby liner, diaper liners. And so they realized they've, if they decided to do government contracting work that maybe business would pick up a bit. So it's kind of an ironic way to start. So this my my friend, uh, Hazel. Um, She's sewing on a sewing machine, um, and um, it's, it's pretty big. They all had to be adapted. Singer holds a lot of history. We had a lot of Singer sewing machines. These machines that they used to build the Apollo suits were all Singers, and we have a very sweet tradition, as us seamstresses do. From the mid-60s, all of our sewing machines get a name. Now, the two sewing machines that they used for the Apollo uh, making the Apollo suits were Big Mo and Sweet Sue. Here we go. Now, I happen to be fortunate when I went to ILC to over three years ago, because I'm NASA badged, Bill Airy, who's the historian there and also is our speaker, he let me go into the sewing room. It, and again, there's security, you have to tight security to go back there. This woman who I'm dearly hugging, her name is Ruthie Ratledge, and up until two years ago, she worked at ILC Dover part-time. She's the last surviving woman that sewed on the Apollo suits. So of all the seamstresses, we always said she was a heroine to us because she has a lot of history behind her. But I find it amazing. She worked on Mar any, a lot of Mars projects, but her last, and she worked on Apollo, but then she was working on shuttle suits up until the time she retired, two years ago. Now, this piece of fabric that I have and the piece of wood, again, I tie it into the Wright brothers. I don't know if you were aware of that when Neil Armstrong went to the moon, he actually took a piece of fabric with him on the lunar module in a kit called the PPK, which is their personal preference kit. The astronauts are allowed a little over four pounds of personal items that they can take with them. And they asked Neil if he would take some fabric with him. And that little piece of, middle is part, uh, piece of wood in the middle is part of the prop that they had. So both of those made it to the moon. 
So this is me right here, believe it or not, about, about a year and a half ago, Mark Armstrong, Neil Armstrong's son, called me up on the phone and said, I have a special project for you. We're taking some fabric um, to, that went to the moon. Um, you're not really allowed to talk about it right now, but we're going to be celebrating the 50th anniversary with the first movie, with the movie First Man. And he said, we're getting fabric ready for auction, and I want you to come down and cut it for me. So this is a piece, this is the piece that actually went to the moon. So they had me cut it in 191 pieces. I couldn't touch it, which is a seamstress who's very tactile with her hands. Of course, being historical, I'm not supposed to touch fabric. So I had rubber gloves on as I'm cutting it. And at the end, there was a few threads that were on the table. And um, the gentleman, Craig, who owns the business, said, you can touch the fabric now. But literally, I, I kind of said, it's kind of funny, because it's kind of shaped like the state of Ohio. And I said, I find that very appropriate. But in this next slide, you'll see just how damaged it was. You'll see the rust stains. There's oil stains. But I don't know if I have any seamstresses here, but I'm going to give a quick description. When you have the outer edge of a fabric, that's a selvage. The 45 degree angle that you have is the most stretch or the bias that you have on a piece of fabric. Well, when I was cutting the fabric, you can see I have magnifying glasses on in my little gloves. So I, I, I stopped. And Craig, who owns the business, said, what's wrong, Gene? And I said, there's a pencil line on this fabric. And he goes, we didn't see that. I said, well, I have these on. So the significance with that is, is since the fabric that made it to the moon was on the left wing of the Wright Brothers plane, anybody who works in sewing knows you need as much stretch as you can with a fabric. So of course, cutting it on the bias is the most important. And the fact that I said to Craig, Wilbur must have marked this piece of fabric. It's at a perfect 45 degree angle. And he said, we had no idea. I'm going to have to call Mark right away and tell him what you found. So that was a thrill that I was able to see something like that. Now, another person I like to pay homage to, my friend Herb Baker, worked at Johnson at the Space Center there. And his mother was Aileen Barker. And that's her there in the bottom corner actually sewing. When we had Skylab and we had a, pan, a protective panel off the rocket fall off and um, all the thermal protection in that one area, Skylab got to be extremely hot temperature. So the next flight, his mother was the one that actually sewed the protective cover that they put on there. So again, seamstress to save history again, because we do. <laughs> Here we go. Now, this building right here looks very nondescript, but it's the building that I worked in. For those of you that may or may not be familiar with the thermal protection on the shuttle, a lot of it is thermal tile, and that's the, uh, the building on, on the end, right? The, oops, excuse me. There we go. Where you see the blue, um, blue uh, structures outside, that's the end we build our um, shuttle tile. But in that two-story area that you see, that's where we ladies sewed at. So we got to see a lot of the tile production and things being made. So we have our main components for our shuttle. We've got, this is the beanie cap that I was speaking of that I had to go up and work. And those are those Gox hoses. You see how high everything is. is. But we literally built parts for up there inside the beanie cap all the way down to the dome heat shield blankets or the engines that go around the blankets. There we go. This is just an example to show you the variances that we have on shuttle. We actually have, believe it or not, fabric blankets that us ladies sew that go here and here down the side. We have reinforced carbon carbon on the nose and on the leading edge of the wing. And of course, we have the tile at the bottom. And where you see on top of the payload bay door and in some areas on the side of the shuttle, we have a felt called frizzy or flexible reusable surface insulation that protects to over 700 degrees. Now the blankets that we sewed on shuttle, people are shocked when I tell them that beginning in 1984, we actually started taking off tile, uh, white tile specifically, and we replaced them with blankets. Now people will say it's, oh, because the tile kept falling off. But that wasn't the reason why. We found, as we gradually did, like anything else, the more fabric that you put on a vehicle, the more weight you can save. And uh, we put about 2,300 blankets that we have a giant sewing machine that I will talk about later. But we have 2,300 blankets. And those blankets can do the exact temperature range 
exactly as the tile did, which was anywhere from 650 to 1300 degrees. Here we go. And that's me, <laughs> a long time ago. We weren't allowed a lot of photographs in there for security. So what I'm doing there is I'm actually in the nose landing gear door, right, right underneath the nose or right before the nose. And what I'm doing there is I'm hand sewing thermal barriers in. Now those thermal barriers are, are um, stitched with a high temperature thread called AB440. It's a bright neon pink and it melts at 3,250 degrees. But the ironic thing about that is it's too fragile to go inside a sewing machine. It frays way too much. So those thermal barriers are four feet long and they take us four days a piece to sew. And what I'm doing there is I'm hand sewing three layers together because we have three on each wheel well door. So it takes two of us a minimum of 17 hours just to hand stitch all 12 of them in and that's only one wheel well. There we go. And that's me again. This is on the flight deck of Discovery. This is the fashionable outfit that we had to wear when we worked inside shuttle. We had boots that came up to here. We had to tape our glasses and tape our rings and ideally wear no makeup because we wanted that area completely clean when we worked inside of her. There we go. This is upstairs in our sewing room. I get a lot of ladies ask me what it looks like upstairs. We have a lot of sewing machines up there. Jukies, Janomis, you name it, we usually have them all up there. Now what I have here on the table, these are all the examples of all the parts we sew by hand. It's a lot. So this is a, th a thruster, this is a horse collar, and uh, this is an arrowhead blanket that I will speak of later. But these are all of the parts that we sewed by hand. A lot of hand sewing on them. Here we go. And this is more examples of our hand sewing parts. Here we go. This is a special blanket, extremely special blanket. It's called an arrowhead blanket. And uh, it's the only blanket that we have on the belly of the orbiter. And people say, how does a blanket survive the heat of space? Well, that's a good question. That same fabric that we use, the reinforced carbon-carbon, to do the nose and the leading edge of the wing, we have a protective plate that we cover that with, so that's how it's able to withstand the heat. But the reason why this blanket is so special, number one, it takes us five days to do it by hand, so that's a long time, but its job is done in less than two minutes. That's a little frustrating, but it's an extremely important blanket. This blanket is where we, right in the very middle of it, right here, right there, we have three attachment points of the orange external tank and the very top attachment point goes in the middle of that blanket. Before we had that blanket, we would use explosive bolts to kick off the external tank and they consistently, the tile in that area were cracking. And so we knew we had to do something. So this blanket is actually bolted. You see the little penetration holes all the way around. These are all done by hand. Those are bolted on to the bottom of the shuttle. Back in 2009, we really re felt, we, re we knew then how important that blanket was because when the explosive bolts kick off the external tank, they're supposed to shoot out this way. But one day on one of the flights on Discovery, it actually shot straight up. And if that blanket wasn't there to catch it, it probably would have gone right through a tile and maybe even to the skin of the orbiter. So that was it's an impressive blanket. A little frustrating because it's not used for very long, but its job is so very important and it's done completely by hand. There we go. And you can see right here exactly where that blanket goes because that's the plate it gets installed on. So this is the nose landing gear door. So when I was in there sewing, I was right about there in that picture stitching them in because you can see the thermal barriers lining the door. But that's where that special blanket goes. And this right here is our leading edge of our wing. Surprisingly, it's considered a fabric, the reinforced carbon-carbon. It starts off as graphite rayon fabric, but when we inject it with phenolic resin in seven different steps, it gets layered much like fiberglass would do. So people think it's the bottom of the shuttle that gets the hottest on Randry. Well, you can tell them they're absolutely wrong because it's the crook of the wing on panels six, seven, and eight of the 22 panels that are on each of the wings. The fabric there, the RCC, is only between a quarter and a half an inch thick. That's the second hottest area. 
the hottest is right underneath her nose. We build the nose out of five inches of reinforced carbon carbon, and at that thickness, it will do a minimum of 4,000 degrees. Our shuttle tile, no matter how thick they are, 2,300 is the hottest they will do. But as seamstresses, inside the nose, we hand sew a bowl-shaped blanket and fill the 19 inches of cavity with little blankets called puzzle blankets because they fit together like puzzle pieces. So that's another thing that we do by hand. Here we go. Um, the blanket I mentioned earlier, this is a horse collar, again, in this area right here. Right underneath this row of tile right here. These horse collars, we stitch by hand. They take us about five to six days to do by, by hand, again. This is how we install them. I say it looks like Cousin It from the Adams Family, for those of you old enough to remember, because that's what it reminds me of. And what we do is we pull them. We put them, we wrap them in a structure, in a rectangular shape, and where that row of tile is, those are the tile that go right there, and we actually pull them down into place. That's why all those threads are hand sewn on, so we can pull them down into place. And here's a picture of the nose. This is the chin panel, that curved panel right there. That's the part that's the absolute hottest on reentry. Even though that fabric is rated for roughly 4,000, we don't want to go up that high when we're coming in. So the highest that we've ever measured with our thermal couples was about 2,880 degrees. Here we go. And this is me again. <laughs> um, what I'm doing right here is, I was fortunate enough that before we lost Discovery to the annals of history, when she went to Discovery, I was the last one that sewed her thermal berries into her. So before she went up to Smithsonian, they let me climb up in the wheel well one last time, and I'm pointing out to my then were bright pink stitches, because our thread is bright pink, but after a while when it gets exposed to air, the thread turns white. So three years ago, I spoke at the, excuse me, the Smithsonian, and they let me go back up in the wheel well again. And unfortunately, they're very hard to see now, but the thread has turned white. But I have a picture of me when I was there pointing out again to my stitches because I did that. And it's a source of pride for me that I was able to do that. Here we go. That's just another example of some of the films and some of the fabrics that we have upstairs. Oh, this is a neat machine neat machine. When I talk about old machines, people are surprised when I tell them we actually had three antique sewing machines that we used. You know, you think something is modern as shuttle. Why do you need old sewing machines? Well, anybody who knows who sews, that's when they made real machines, all metal, very heavy duty, very strong industrial machines. And we were fortunate that we actually had three Singer 9710 sewing machines that were built between 1914 and 1917. All three other jobs were sewing saddles, but they were too small for our use. So we took them from this size, extended them out to five feet long so that we could sew our engine blankets. Now this picture here, his name is Lurch. Remember I mentioned earlier we name our sewing machines? Well, Lurch was our oldest sewing machine at 19, built in 1914. So Lurch is the one that quilts our engine blankets. And that's what Lurch -like looked like before. And that's what Lurch looks like now. You can see right here that we modified him. That picture, the earlier one, is right there. But we took a section of the arm off and extended it out. And that's how we raise and lower our needle. That's the machine we quilt our engine blankets with. So here we are. These are called dome heat shield blankets. They're the biggest blankets that we built on shuttle. They're eight and a half feet across, have three layers of serochrome in them. It takes us a day just to mark the stitch lines and to cut the serochrome that goes inside. And on average, it takes us about four and a half days to do one. And we have two of them on the engines. There's 12 rows of quilting this way, 124 that radiate out. And because we can't have any bumps on any of our surfaces because heat is naturally drawn towards that. We have to, over 240 times, hand knot and bury all of our knots all the way around. And, uh, and then we have a four inch sleeving like a bias tape that we hand sew on the inner and outer edge of the blanket. And we have these blankets for sound suppression by the engines. But the most amazing thing about this blanket is, and probably the most unique hand sewing example is, because people are absolutely shocked when I tell them how we install the blankets for flight because we hand sew them onto the back of the shuttle with a wire thread called Inconel 625. 
if we're lucky, that they'll land, they'll last about three flights. But if we get any type of an engine discharge on the blanket, NASA requires us, after all that work, and even just one flight, we have to take the blanket off and dissect it to see what the problem was. This is an amazing sewing machine. He doesn't really have a name. We just call him the multi-needle sewing machine. There's only two of them in the whole United States, and we have one at Kennedy Space Center. The quilted blankets that we have outside the shuttle, this is the machine that does that. This machine is 10 feet tall. It's so heavy, we actually have to reinforce the floor. The needles are nine inches long, and this always brings a smile to the men's faces, generally. When this area right here, we have four gallons of WD-40 there. So when we tell people, if they're looking for the machine, because we do a lot of tours in the building, just smell. You can find the WD-40, and generally everybody can find the machine. What happens is, is that actually lubricates our fabric and our needles, because the blankets that we're sewing on that are anywhere between literally as thin as a placemat to two inches thick that we're doing. Um, What's so neat about the machine, though, is it, it's intimidating. When you're first learning how to use it, it is an intimidating machine to use. But again, we're, the, we're very lucky to have one. It only takes about three and a half minutes. We stretch our fabric like you would do a normal quilt, which, by the way, I, I, people ask me that. Um, it's quartz fabric that we have, quartz silica. Our thread is quartz silica that does it. We have stacked sheets of, um, of, of quartz that we use inside the blanket for our batting, and the backing fabric is just plain old fiberglass that glues, gets glued right onto the shuttle skin. It takes about three and a half minutes for it to quilt. And so what's coming out right here, this is called a production unit. We just call them PUs. It's a 30 by 30 inch piece of fabric that comes out of there. And from there, we ladies look at the blueprints and that's how we build our parts. We used to hand draw our own patterns. Now that's surprising to people too. We had to know how to read blueprints so we could create our own patterns. So we'll put our blanket, our pattern behind that and cut it out. Every blanket is knotted by hand all the way around. We flip the fabric to the back and we hand sew them. The reason why we had such a weight savings when we converted to these, because if you can imagine the size of a tile, this is a 30 by 30 inch piece of fabric that's quilted. We could fit between 15 and 25 tile, depending on its size, right there. But it saved us. After we started using the blankets, the first two shuttles took us about four and a half pe uh, years apiece to build. Once we switched over to our blankets, that was 7,000 less tile we had to build. And each, the last three shuttles took us roughly two and a half years to build. We saved a lot of time and a lot of weight, 7,000 pounds alone. And even though the blanket is heavier than a tile, and by the way, if anybody stops at my booth after this, I have some two space shuttle tile with me that you, if you guys can find me on the main floor, I'll let you pick them up because everybody wants to touch a tile. Um, here we go. Here we go. This is our top threads. We have air, little tubes. We use air to shoot our thread through for our machine. And like, again, there's 30 needles. Now this is the process. Those are my hands. Um, it shows you how we finish off the blanket. We knot all the way around the edges. Oh, oops, sorry. Here we go. We knot all the way around the edges, and that takes time to do. Then we flip the fabric to the back, and all 2,300 blankets are sewed on, uh, stitched by hand to close out the back. The process for the blanket is, um, after we build the blanket and we know it's going to fit because we do a pre-fit, it's surprising to people when I tell them we bake our blankets because we do. We'll bake, bake them for four hours at 650 degrees and then for two hours we bump it up to 850 degrees. It's called heat cleaning and all the blankets get baked beforehand and it turns off-white beigey fabric, literally it looks like silk when we take them out of the oven. It almost glows, the fabric does. We'll paint the RTV room temperature vulcanization glue on the back of the blanket, blanket gets stuck on there, and then we put two coats of ceramic nine paint. It's a clear coat that we put on initially, and then four hours later we put a white chalky one on. So if you get a chance to see a shuttle and she looks like paper mache, that's the reason why. And this is just an example here. You can see some of the blankets here. I picked this picture here. I'll show a close-up. When we get a tear in the blanket, there we go. You can see the arrow here. We patch them up by hand. 
Now, people will say to me, wow, that must have been a heck of an asteroid or meteorite or whatever that hit her. And I go, no, it's the guys at the processing facility. <laughs> well, that can't be. And I go, well, she, she literally is in three layers of scaffolding. When you first go into the bay to work on her, you have to ask at the desk, which is forward, because you really can't tell because she's covered with scaffolding. So the guys will be working up there, and believe it or not, will accidentally catch a piece of machinery and tear her. <laughs> Just tear her. So we have to go up there with our quartz fabric and hand sew a patch on her, which I find very endearing because it's just like patching a pair of jeans. And then it will get the two coats of ceramic paint and she's good to go, but she's got patches all over her. This happens to be the biggest one we have on Atlantis. The nose is on this side, so it's very close to the nose. Um, here we go, let me switch it there. Now this right here is the star tracker. You guys track stars and so do we. That's kind of like our star GPS. Um, I have that picture up there because my friends thought I was a little bit anal, to be honest with you. I was so excited about being able to work on the shuttle that I kept my own logbook. I would write down the part number, where it was going to go, and what shuttle it was going to. And so I can look at Atlantis and tell you exactly if you come to visit where I, what blanket I built. And, and I happen to build this one for sure. That one right there. That's a tricky one to do because that blanket is less than a half an inch thick. For anybody who sews, I'm coring. I'm coring all those penetration holes in it. We put a sleeving in there and hand sew all the way around. And it, I can't break the blanket. If it cracks, it automatically has to go off. But that's one of them I made for her. But that's our star tracker system. That will slide aside, and the astronauts will actually look at the stars to tell where they are in space. So that's our star tracker system. We have two on shuttle. And this is a close-up of the Ohms pods. You can really see an example of all these blankets. We have them up the tail on the Ohms pod. And these dark blankets here, people ask me all the time, when you guys fly, do you replace the blankets and tile every flight? And I go, if we did that, we would never fly. <laughs> so in the example of Atlantis, and it's a really good example, believe it or not, her first flight was October 3rd of 1985. 80% of her tiles are still the originals, and 82% of her blankets are still the originals. And the reason why I have this picture up here is where you see the darker blankets here, those are the original blankets on her. Our tiles actually lighten like charcoal, and the blankets will darken subsequently more every time we have a flight. So some of the things that we did you would never think about us doing, you see in this picture right here, on the Ohm's pod right there, on the left one, we actually had a class 11 blanket peeled back. Class 11 is our thickest blanket. They're two inches thick. There was a concern that if they came home, again, if you have anything above flat, heat is naturally drawn towards that. And that's a real thick blanket. It's right where the tiles and the blankets interface, right there, right in there. And um, so what we had to do is we literally had four days to replicate that whole section on the shuttle. That meant firing up the multi-needle machine, quilting class 11, our thick blankets. The guys downstairs had to build new tile, and we actually had to replicate this whole section for them. And we had, to, had, we had about four days to do it. They had to ship it overnight so we could do wind tunnel testing to see if we could not get the blanket back into place, would it cause detriment for them when they returned. So then we have John Olivas, and that's him trying to fix it. And you can see it's right there. So we laughed because when he was out there doing his spacewalk, he had a little surgical kit with a little teeny needle, and he actually was trying to hand sew it into place. So we're all watching him on NASA TV, and we're all laughing. And everybody's <laughs> going, what's so funny? And I go, because that blanket's that thick. He, he can't fix it with that. So then he took, a, he had a, another stitch kit and he pulled out a, a stapler and he tried to staple it into place and still couldn't get it to be completely where it needed to be. And, and, and subsequently we found out with the testing, if the blanket was peeled back, it still would have been all right. So he did what anybody else would do. He just took his two fingers of his gloved hand and just packed that blanket down <laughs> as hard as he could get it to go because that was the best he could do. And she made it back home fine. Here we go. This is just some examples of our tile. We have unusual ones. Some people don't see these very often. This one's called a protuberance tile, and I don't know if you can see that there's a hump in the middle of that. We will deliberately put special um, 
things like that on our tile so that in certain key areas we can get temperature readings. Because again, anything that's not flat, excessive heat is drawn towards. So we do have special tile that we will do to do testing with. And that's just the guys putting them on. It's very unceremoniously when we take a tile out because we surround a tile with plastic called shim and they make a plastic knife and just stick it up the center and shave away and just pull it out. Um, some of our tile look very battered, but they still pass inspection. We're allowed a certain depth for the tile to go to. Uh, we visually inspect all 24,000 tile, all 2,300 blankets. They all have to be waterproofed. Um, but again, with the, with the, uh, we have a wrist-held machine that we can actually scan the tile called an Optigo, and it tells us how deep the, the um, groove might be. And once we get below a certain depth, we have to pull the tile. There we go. So this is EFT1. We had it in December of 2014. And I bring that as a source of pride because we made the tile for that in our building. We're still building tile in the building. Only these are special tile. They're called Tuffy Tile or Tough and Unipiece uh, fibrous insulated tile, and these tiles are rated for 4,000 degrees apiece. Because when we had our first launch of EFT1 as part of the Orion program, she came in at a much more steep, steeper angle, so we had to have really tough tile. So we built those for her. Here we go. And that's me standing underneath the beanie cap. This is part of the display. We have the beanie cap on display at the Atlantis exhibit, and I'm at a much happier level where the beanie cap is on ground level there. <laughs> but anyway, again, there it is up there. Those are the hoses I would have to fix. And you can see up there, and there's the Ohm's pod and those special blankets. Here we go. This right here is another special thing. On the Glory mission back in 2011, believe it or not, they were just about to get ready to launch the rocket when they realized that the nozzle did not have enough thermal protection. I don't know how you can get that far into flight and realize that you don't have enough thermal protection for an area around the nozzle. So literally about two months before the flight, we got a panic call saying, one of you ladies have got to come up with a special blanket and it has to be very light. Every time you fly, every part is weighed. You, don't, you have a plus or minus for weight. So it had to be a negligible change in weight. So my friend Kathy Evans and I won an award for that blanket because NASA let us go under some of our specs, and that blanket was only this thin and we had to do it by hand, and the blanket could only weigh 130 grams, and that's the first time we did a thermal blanket that was that light, and yet still met specifications, and the rocket was able to launch with that added bonus. So there's things like that that we get called to do upon every now and then. So. I had to put this one in. <laughs> I had to put this one in. I was fortunate enough that I was at Goddard on, on uh, New Year's Eve, and I gave Brian May a piece of flown fabric from the payload bay of the shuttle. So he gave me a hug when I gave it to him. And of course, I have Alice Bowman, who's mom of the flight for New Horizons. And uh, I met her for the first time, and um, I know she's been a speaker here at NEEF before. And, that, and that's Alan, who will be here. And uh, the reason why we're putting our fingers up there is to this day, people question how many planets we have. So Alan's a big, he's saying, put up nine fingers, put up nine fingers. Planet, Pluto's a planet, Pluto's a planet, even though a lot of people argue with that. And that's me standing in front of Ultima Thule. So it was very exciting that night, not only to meet Brian May, but um, also to be a part of history that night. So I'm almost done. I do make ties and uh, shirts. But my items are pretty special, I think, because I was able to buy from a collector payload bay fabric from two Columbia flights and Endeavor flight and Discovery. So everything that I sew has a piece of flown fabric in it. Everything that I make does. Here we go. So this is me. I had to blow my picture up so you could see me. This is me standing underneath the stack. That full stack is 185 feet tall, and when I developed my picture and it was only four by six, I looked like I was this high, and you couldn't even see me. So um, it's so thrilling because nobody gets a chance to uh, actually do anything neat like that. So I, I'm, I'm almost done, but I'm bringing up the fact, I know everybody talks about STEM career, and STEM is important, but NASA finally, and I stress finally recognized about five years ago, they now refer to a STEAM career. Now, I know I have some people who will say, oh, well, what's the big deal about art? 
Well, art is very important to me. When I was a young girl, I have a twin sister named Joan, and we used to take crayons and draw patch designs and send them to Houston when we were young girls. And of course, they would always, had already had selected designs, so we would get a thanks but no thanks letter back from them. But we still kept plugging away, and they, kept, they would send us pictures. But I was all right in math and science. I've always been a creative woman, so when NASA finally recognized the arts, that's what I talk about. You're talking about a young girl from Michigan who never thought she had a chance to work on anything to do with NASA. And from the time I was little, I always wanted to. Um, so when I got the job here at Kennedy, and I, as a seamstress, I, I've been sewing since I was seven. I'm 63 now, so I've been sewing a long time. And you would think something as little as sewing, but because I'm a quilter and I have, if I might say, Beautiful even stitches. I get asked a lot to do research and development for NASA because I have such precise, accurate sewing. Now, to some people, that might not be a big deal, but for anybody who sews, it's quite an honor. But for kids, when I do speak, I tell kids, you know what? Yes, math and science is important. And we had to do math because even something as basic as our gap fillers between the tiles or even blankets that we made, we had our own scale and we had to do mathematical calculations as to how many grams of batting a part that we were building would have to have. So there's no denying math's important. But for a kid like me who was always drawing and always creative, the fact that NASA finally has recognized creativity, I tell kids, hey, we're looking for out of the box thinkers. We're looking for people who can draw. Because in the days before we had cameras, how did an idea get across? You generally had to draw, and that's what we even do to this day in various ways. If you, need, if you know how to write, you need to describe your new vehicle, what you're doing. And I just say, you know what? Here's a little kid from me from Michigan. I never thought I had a chance. And I got to sew on the shuttle, and to this day, I was only one of 18 ladies that got to do that. And I happened to be the very last seamstress in the whole program that got hired. My chances of getting hired were slim to none because they hadn't hired anybody in nine years before me. And it was divine providence. I don't have it on today, but I have a lanyard that I, hang, I used to hang on my mirror in my dresser and every day would look at that and say, someday there's going to be NASA pins on that lanyard. I just know it. And I would say to God, oh, please, I want to be out there so bad. And so I had an interview, and um, it was a two-hour-long interview, very nervous, but I knew what I was talking about because I wanted so badly to be out there. I studied on the computer for six months everything I could learn about thermal protection. I mean, I knew the basics, but I wanted to know everything. So I got interviewed, found out four, laters, I got, four days later I got the job, and my boss said to me, you know, we only invited you to go out the thermal protection facility the day after, I mean, the day you had your interview, because I thought everybody got asked, and he said, no. He said, I saw a passion in you. I saw a love for the shuttle that you had. And he said, the building, we've been through a lot since we lost Columbia. And he said, you were the heart I knew the building needed. So he said, as soon as you left the room, I told everybody on the panel, we'll interview the other ladies, but I want this one. So to this day, I am so glad. I still have the lanyard. I still wear my lanyard. I have all my NASA pins on all the flights that I've worked, and then some. But I'm just here to let everybody know, yes, math and science is important, but we need out-of-the-box thinkers and creative people. We really, really do. So thank you for your time, and thank you for listening. Thank you. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Oh, you got to speak. Oh. <laughs>
Hi, I'm Dave Eicher, editor of Astronomy, and I'm here in beautiful, sunny California at Celestron, the world's leading manufacturer of telescopes. Today we're going to get the lowdown on a secret, a new hot product that's unlike anything you've ever seen. So let's go inside and check it out. So Corey, Celestron has a really new, exciting, mm -hmm. unique telescope. Tell me about the Rasa 36. Yes, the Rasa 36, it's a 14-inch Rasa. We have had the 11-inch Rasa out there for a while now, and we have been secretly developing a Rasa 36, a 14-inch version of it. It's still at f2.2, so you will get you very good speed, but in, with increased aperture. Mm. And this is a really wide field, a high-tech camera, astro imaging camera. You could capture incredible wide field views of the Milky Way, big vistas of comets, but there's a really special application that this telescope is perfect for. Talk a little bit about that. We've been getting feedback from different people. One of them is from uh, a lot of users in the SSA community. SSA stands for Space Situation Awareness. What that means is space junk detecting. More and more satellites are out in orbit, and inevitably they will hit one another, and you know, they become space junk. A lot of them will stay up there for 25 years, mm -hmm. and if, depending on in what orbit they're in, you can be up there forever. What SSA community does is they track this, these junk so that uh, we can notify the satellite operators so they can maneuver to avoid them. We identify the need, we find a solution. We want to make astronomy fun, and at the same time, we also want to keep everybody safe. For over a decade, the Friscope has been one of our customers' favorite products. It's easy to use, affordable, and provides really impressive views for a scope of its size. When the time came to update the Friscope, I teamed up with renowned lunar imager Robert Reeves to create a telescope that would inspire the next generation of amateur astronomers to explore the moon. Hello, my name is Robert Reeves. For the past 59 years, the moon has been my passion. Why? Well, the moon is the closest world to Earth. The moon is in our sky almost every night. The moon is close enough that we can see amazing detail on the surface with even modest telescopes. The Robert Reeves Signature Series First Scope is more than just a telescope. It's your guide to the moon. The telescope tube is a map of the moon's most notable features so you can learn the moon's geography. This telescope walks you through the basics and unlocks the entire hobby of astronomy, making it fun, easy, and accessible for everyone. So I invite you to get out under the stars and enjoy a voyage to the moon.